Okay, man, are you ready to go? I'm He's ready to go. Now, come on, now, crank right? this motherfucker up. Hello, Internet. Gino, that Pinguino Grieco here again with another episode of Deep Listens. And today, it's a cursed episode because we had to play a podcast game that was picked by someone other than one of the hosts. A cursed game picked by a cursed man. We played Divinity Dragon Commander. It's a RTS, kind of, and it's kind of Mass Effect. Wishes it was both of those things. And joining me on my journey to play this game... That is totally okay. Pete Busby. Hey, hey. This was a game. It had all the elements and more of a game. Some of which were interesting. Um, in honor of a dragon game, I tried to find some dragon fun facts. Turns out they're not real. So I went with Komodo dragons instead. Boo. I know. I'm sorry. I got two. So one, Komodo dragons can eat 80% of their body weight. In one meal, pretty cool. The better one, though, is that Komodo dragons are cannibalistic. What? So, it, yeah, they're cannibals. They'll eat baby Komodo dragons. So, in order, that's not the fun part of the fact. <laughs> so, in order to protect themselves, baby dragons will cover themselves in feces whenever they need to be around adults, because I guess that makes them unappetizing. Which, sure, yeah, I wouldn't eat a baby Komodo dragon covered in poop. You know that's so that's ingenuity right there. That's really. I crafty. like that. I like that the poop is the only way they can get them to not eat yep. their own babies. Otherwise, they're fair game. These dragons mm. are hardcore. I'm glad that the fun fact was not just the. Do you know Komodo dragons are like they're not poisonous, but their bacteria in their mouths are so bad that it's basically poison. They actually, it's both. I did find that, so they do have all like gross sepsis in their mouth but they also have venomous molars oh i did not know about the venomous molars i knew about the sepsis you get a twofer yeah that's no good well that other voice you heard is m paladino hello hello everyone uh gino you really showed your hand really early on this one uh, of how we thought about this game it's fine it's okay i guess it's a game the game parts are the worst parts. The other yeah. parts are the best parts. It's true. We're going to talk about that. But I not like the actual video game is actually good. Yeah, you I liked watching it around. much better than playing it. Yep. And that other voice you hear is the cursed one. Chris Zombie Pie Redacted. You know, screw you. I'm doing a food review. I bought tomato bark. I knew God it. Damn it. Uh, 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 Before we started bark. recording, I heard uh, clicking I and clacking. I heard mouth smacks, and I was like, are you going to oh. do a food thing? Because I swear, if you do this to me again, I'll I'll be upset. And then here we are. Okay. That ain't bad. What are you eating? What, are what you is eating? this? This is tomato bark. I've never heard of this. It's basically a fruit roll-up, but it's flavored to be tomato. That's, yeah. that's a nightmare. It actually works. It like tastes like if you're eating dried pizza sauce that's chewy like a candy. No, I don't what hate you it. it. Sounds good. Oh god! Like if this is the positive review, I'm off. I'm out. It's like a film that that's on the top of pizza sauce. Mm. Yum! Imagine if you wanted to just eat pizza sauce and you wanted yes. to be chewy like a fruit roll up. Yes. <laughs> it has vitamin C and it's all natural. Tell me more. <laughs> Ooh, vitamin it's C like and if you all that. Found crusty like a... shit inside of your oven, and you just discovered it is to a little scrape crusty. that off. I, I'm just gonna be honest; it Ooh. does taste like the weird, gooey stuff that you scrape off of a pizza pan. Uh, no, no. Texture for that was not great. Uh, I'm gonna give that a solid three and a half. It's like you know how, how everybody's favorite part of the soup is like the weird skin that forms on the top if you yeah. don't eat it fast enough. That film. That's for you. Mm. Yum yum yum. It's like. She in parts. I don't know if like something coagulated that wasn't supposed to coagulated, but the good news is it's gluten free. Well, I'm glad that in this food review we use the term film and coagulate. 
You know what else is gluten free? Nothing. And I would rather eat that. <laughs> That's a great point. So you did this to us. We played Divinity Dragon Commander. I did. On a more, I would say, generous year, that's not 2020, I would say that Divinity would be a solid contender, if not one of the top contenders for the Platypus Award, just because of how bizarre, and it's a Chimera monster meets Frankenstein monster of a video game, but alas, I think that it's not even going to place in the top three for the Platypus Award this year. Not even of the games we've already played. It's been that kind of year, folks. Um, so without further ado, uh, just a reminder, you can get in touch with the show at deep listens pod on Twitter, deep listens.libson.com. We've got our comment sections and deep listens podcast at gmail.com. You can send in emails. We read them sometimes. We do not have any emails today, but you can also support the show on patreon.com slash deep listens. And if you do so, you will get access to our discord where you can talk with the host of the show about a variety of things like this game and, other things that you can learn about on the Discord report. The Discord report. I don't want to do the Discord report this week because all what? I would talk about is stuff that ZP has done. No, we got some stuff. ZP is here. You know what? This, we got some stuff. The PlayStation was announced. We talked all about that. Right. I guess we could talk about that. This week on the Discord Report, the PlayStation 5 was announced, and it's going to be $500. Or, or 400 hmm. if you don't get a disk drive. Yeah. Which I never get discs anyway, so I'll save some money. Uh, they also announced Final Fantasy 16. Yeah. Which looks like some fantasy... Is that the number we're up to now? That's the new one. Yeah. Okay. We're up to 16 which means there is only 14 more to go until Final Fantasy XXX. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing we where did, they go. We that. did get people on my blog asking, Gina, what you and I thought of it. It looks fine. It looks fine. I, I don't know. not Sick. more of the shit that has defined everything 14 post. The combat looks like 15, and that makes me sad. Um, I don't know about the story yet because they haven't revealed very much about it. Uh, the the men are pretty. The ladies are pretty. It's a Final Fantasy game. People are uh, thinking that there are not enough ladies. Uh, I'm thinking we only saw four minutes. Yeah. So it's a little early to tell. Yep. But it can't be any worse than 15 as far as that goes. You can just let me know when there's another tactics. I'm out until then. I'll, okay. I will. There's, yeah. yeah. I mean, you get... Uh, you get some crystals, you get some summons. There's a very good boy who seems to be some sort of summon boy. You know, it's Final Fantasy. And we'll see if it turns out well. When they announced the PS5, I looked up whether it was backwards compatible because I recently traded in a bunch of, like, cards and games and things to a store that had store credit that could only be spent in store. And so I couldn't order things from them later on. And so I used all of my store credit to buy a disc copy of the FF7 remaster, but I do not own a PS4. So I was like, well, crap. At least, the, you know, the PS5 is coming out soon, and it'll probably be backwards compatible. And it is, so that's good. But uh, the disk drive one is $100 more than the non-disk drive one. And so I have, in buying a single PS4 game on a disk, locked myself into buying a disk drive PS5. Why did you actually buy that game if you didn't have a PS4? So I had like $100 in store credit, and it was a used game store. So like a bunch of the games they had were bad, or I was not interested in at all. And then the expensive games they had were like collector's items, like Metroid Prime and Super Smash Bros. Melee, like games that are harder to find. So instead I bought a copy of Math Blaster for the Sega Genesis, a copy of Final Fantasy VII Remaster, and I think I bought one other bad game, but I can't remember what it was. But I'm very happy that I got Math Blaster, so I can finally learn how to add. That's our next podcast game. Yeah. Oh, what if I... Uh, you shouldn't have put that idea in my head. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It probably won't be, but we'll see how I feel by the end of this. So it's now time, once again, for my obsession of the week. 
And this time, my obsession is the movie Black Dynamite. Mm, good choice. Have you seen Black oh, Dynamite? Oh, yeah. Black why, Dynamite. But... Black Dynamite is a 2009 kind of black exploitation parody, but it takes itself quite seriously. It stars the titular Black Dynamite, who is a an ex CIA agent who has come sure. back to yep. the hood because his brother Jimmy was killed under suspicious circumstances. And oh, so he is yeah. going to bring justice to the streets. He's cleaning up the streets. He's getting the smack sure. off the streets. He, he falls in with some radicals. It goes to 11 pretty quick. It goes very far to 11. There's a lot of great moments. There's just a you lot of You think it's going to stop. There's a point where you think the movie's going to stop and then it keeps going. Yes, there's it extends the conspiracies within conspiracies. It's great. There's like a lot of great attention to detail to make the whole vibe, the black exploitation vibe fit. Like it feels really poorly produced, but very clearly intentionally. Like, there's a scene early on where you can see the boom mic descend into the frame, and Black Dynamite is delivering his line, and then he eyes the boom mic, eyes the person he's talking to, and is just, like, very conscious of the fact that it might hit him in the head. There's a scene where a woman's supposed to cry, and she has a tear in her eye, and then it'll cut back to Black Dynamite, and then cut back to Honey Bee, and then she has no tear, and then cut back to Black Dynamite, cut back, tear is back. A lot of great lack of continuity. And it's got some of the – just the best character names of any movie ever made. Black Dynamite, of course. There's Bullhorn, his his friend, his second in command. There's Cream Corn, who's yep. a snitch. Spoilers. It's, it's a it, – it, for me, I, I find it to be a far more well-done version of like the concept of Kung Pao, Enter the Fist. Yes, like, or like I'm going to get you, sucker. Yes, exactly. A lot of movies like that. Uh, so also, here, tell the me, animated series is equally good. It is. Um, yeah, it's a Cartoon Network Adult Swim production. It's quite good. Um, so, stop me when you hear the best name: Black Dynamite, Cream Corn, Bullhorn, Honeybee, Tasty Freeze. Stop. Chocolate Giddy, Sweet Meat. <laughs> I, I think that one's it uh, yep there's chicago wind osiris yeah. backhand jack sahid kotex fiendish dr Wu, and mo bitches and Gunsmoke. uh john Stan john sally's in this movie like nba great john sally it's a good movie you should check it out where do you find it you find it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. It's streaming okay. on Amazon Prime. I rented it there. And the uh, animated series is on Adult Swim's streaming service. I think you create like a Cartoon Network account and you get to watch it. Yep. It's quite good. Never yeah. interrupt Black Dynamite's Kung Fu. But Black Dynamite, I'd sell drugs to the community. <laughs> yes. No one. If you sell drugs to the community, you will have a problem. Black Dynamite, I sell drugs to the community. Good movie. Very good movie. So now let's discuss what we came here to discuss. Divinity colon Dragon Commander. ZP, since you picked this game and did this to us, you tell me why. <laughs> so I guess what I really want to talk about is I want to talk about Larian Studios and the idea of Eurojank. Um, for those that don't know, um, because I think I'm probably the only person on this podcast who has like a deep affinity for computer role-playing games instead of, you know, strategy role-playing games or JRPs. Um, but Eurojank is a beloved part of the CRPG genre in that it's the loving term that we give to all of the CRPGs from, let's say, countries that aren't well known for software and technology and video game development that really want to try. They really do try very hard. And it's the term that we give these games that try to go way over budget with their ambition and they come stuffed with features and more often than not, like none of the features work as intended and the ones that do work only barely work. And they're incredibly ambitious and complex in terms of gameplay and their narratives, 
but then the we have a term called in in film production and video game production called the triangle of truth right which is you can make something cheap on time or good and you can only have two things on that triangle and it is your choice which two of that triangle you want and Eurojank developers try to defy all of that that triangle of truth they always end up biting more off more than they can chew but that doesn't stop them from creating these wonderful marvelous experiences where they really go for it um their their user interfaces are always terrible there's a lack of polish you're going to encounter bugs uh there's a lot of glitches it, they're poorly optimized but I mean, some of the games from what we would call the Eastern Bloc or Eurojank have gone on to become these massive multimedia enterprises. For example, I think people forget, but the Stalker video game series, the Metro Exodus, Metro in general started as a Eurojank series, but the probably the biggest success story in Eurojank history is probably The Witcher, which started out as CD Projekt Poland. CD Projekt Red, small developer of about anywhere between 30 to 45 developers that worked on this very traditional, almost an MMORPG styled CRPG, The Witcher, does well. They make a second game with a bigger budget after they nailed it. Then they made a third game, and now, you know, CD Projekt Red is one of the biggest uh, computer role playing game developers, and they even own good old games gog um larian is interesting in that they are almost a story in themselves so i guess what i'm saying is gino what do you want to know about the people who made this game and their kind of thought process because boy there's a lot to talk about why so (laughs) why that's a great question so Really, if we want to talk about why is this game the way that it is, we actually... So this game came out in 2013, and we really need to go to 2002 to have an understanding of, like, why is Divinity Dragon Commander the game that it is? I love when stories start 10 years before the game came out. So (laughs) in 2002, a video game called Divine Divinity came out. And it is a very classical, it is one of Larian's first games, but it's not their total first game. It is an action role-playing game that plays very much like Diablo. And the defining characteristic of Divine Divinity, it's just one of those isometric kind of like top-down Diablo likes, is that 30 minutes into the game, it suddenly becomes Panzer Dragoon Orda wherein it completely changes the genre of the game from being a traditional CRPG to your character transforms into a dragon, and then all of the sudden you control the dragon as if you're piloting the gummy ships from Kingdom Hearts, and you can't go back, and you have to play the rest of the fucking game like you're playing the gummy ship levels from Kingdom Hearts, and then that's just the game. And so that game does good enough from what I heard. They made... Okay, so Divine Divinity is technically Divinity 1, and then they made Beyond Divinity, and then they made Divinity 2, Ergo Draconis, and, but, but that's not actually Divinity 2. Divinity 2 is actually Divinity Beyond, and Divinity this. 2 is actually Divinity 3. And then they even rebooted Divinity 2, so Ergo Draconis comes out, and then they reboot the franchise with Flames of Vengeance, so it's like 2A, but actually 3A, and then we have 3B, and then we have Dragon Commander, which is set 2,000 years before the events of Divine Divinity, and then we go to the timeline that leads to Beyond Divinity, Divinity 2, and then we lead to the original Sin timeline. And Beyond Divinity, like, each of these games, what you need to realize is that Larian is, so there's two things about Larian. The first thing that you need to know about Larian is that if they love Dungeons and Dragons. However, they don't love what you think you would normally associate with Dungeons and Dragons. Their favorite part of Dungeons and Dragons is the alignment chart. For whatever reason, they have kind of gravitated towards this idea of the alignment chart being the best part of D&D, and they need to bring it back in 5th edition. And we'll talk about how that influenced the design of Dragon Commander. But 
they've never really find found an easy way to put that into their games. So Divine Divinity comes out. It's a CRPG that's a Diablo clone that just suddenly changes genres. Thirty min, like thirty hours into the game, it completely changes genre. And then they make Beyond Divinity, which is a co-op but single player co-op dungeon crawler with an alignment chart where one character is good and the other character is evil and the entire game it's a 40 hour crpg game where you're basically doing an escort mission as if it's resident evil 4 so imagine resident evil 4 but for 40 hours you're describing nightmares why and this then... is miserable Okay. Listening to you describe this is so, miserable. Now we need to go to Divinity Two, which is going to lead us to why. Why? So Divinity Two, for whatever reason, Larian is able to make enough money on these kind of like pie in the sky projects that kind of didn't do very well, like in terms of the execution. So they made Divinity Two, which for a variety of reasons, Divinity Two just came out. It came out hot. And I mean hot as in, like, it needed an extra at least year of development time. But for whatever reason, their publisher, 1C Company, which is a Russian well-known publisher of Eurojank, just forced them to release this game. And not only that, but Larian, which was a team of about 30 to 35 people, their internal dev studio, they contracted a lot of the work for Divinity 2 to other studios, and they bought a lot of proprietary game engine so they were using gamebryo which is the game engine better known for like the elder scrolls franchise and the fallout the modern fallout franchises and they weren't super familiar with how to use that engine and as a result divinity 2 comes out and it is not good it is it releases with a lot of bugs but more importantly than that is we kind of have to talk about how one of the most important CRPGs to ever come out was The Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and then later, probably the most important CRPG ever made is probably Skyrim, because that game basically has pushed the entire CRPG genre down two paths, which is console optimization versus PC optimization. And you can kind of see, like, there's a difference between, say, anything that Bethesda makes and like something like Disco Elysium, like these two schools of thought. We have these two distinct branches. And Divinity 2 tried to do both, and it's kind of like you've got rock and roll and you've got classical music, and they're both good in their own rights. But if you go down the middle on that spectrum, you have a baby banging on a piano, and that's basically what Divinity 2. Same thing. For whatever reason, they decided to honor the idea that, you know, we're going to go back to the gummy ship style, like you transform into a dragon, and now it's a third-person action game after you've been playing it like Diablo, and it just has all of these weird ideas, they didn't have a filter, and it damn near drove Larian Studios bankrupt. Like, almost, they had to pull out a loan for $3 million from, I forget where they're from... They're from Belgium. So they had to pull like $3 million from a bank by the actual Belgian government in order to stay afloat. And they were working on two projects at the time, Dragon Commander and Divinity Original Sin. And uh, this game is the byproduct of a studio that is trying to micromanage two products with a team, internal team of about 30 people. The original budget for Dragon Commander was about $4 million, and that got cut in half, and that money was sent back to Original Sin. And so what you've just played is a game that was made with no more than maybe 30 to 40 people with a budget of around one and a half to $2 million. This is all very impressive. I'm glad that they were able to make this thing uh, despite difficulties that seem to have arisen budgetarily and uh, otherwise. But we played the game, though. It came out in 2013. Um, it is a RTS and also uh, kind of Mass Effect-y. You're making yes. choices. It, it's worth mentioning that this game was originally supposed to be an Xbox Live arcade game, which that doesn't mean like a digital release on the Xbox 360. Like, this was supposed to be a board game version of the Divinity universe that served as 
console gamers' first introduction to the Divinity franchise. This came out Because they were consoles. planning on... Yes. It was actually optimized for consoles. So it was originally just supposed to be the board game thing. The very first design document was, let's make Risk set in the Divinity universe, and this will be an Xbox Live arcade game. Not only that, but they were thinking of releasing it during the summer of arcade promotion. Alongside like games like Braid and Geometry Wars, like those small little micro games. But the problem is, is Larian does not have a filter, and the game got bigger and bigger bigger and bigger and they realized that it would not work as an xbox live arcade game because it was the file size became like five gigabytes then six gigabytes then eventually it was like a 10 gigabyte download and so they said all right this is going to be its own full-fledged game well if we're going to put in the money to make a full-fledged game let's add in a story let's add in our version of an alignment system let's add in multiplayer let's add in and then they had to they kept expanding the game until they realized oh shit we've run out of money also, our actual passion project was Divinity Original Sin. We probably only have the manpower and the money to make one of these two games. So Dragon Commander is going to die for Original Sin. And then Original Sin, original, original Sin actually was good. Well, so Original Sin was funded using Kickstarter. It raised over a million dollars. But the problem that Larian encountered with Original Sin was... A million dollars is great, but after the Kickstarter, you know, fee and after they had to pay for all of the like, you know, tier, you know, the the gifts that you get out of um, Kickstarter, like, ah, we get you get your stretch goal. They only had of the million dollars that they raised about four hundred thousand dollars because they had not planned that shit. It's like, oh, shit, we got to buy T-shirts. We got to buy posters. They did the classic Kickstarter mistake, which is their million dollars turned into about $40,000. 40000 so, or 400000 $400,000. Okay, I'm good. sorry. $400,000. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they need about – they estimated about $4.5 million to make Original Sin, which is still ridiculous. Like you, making Original Sin with, a, with less than $5 million, still Barker's crazy. But – they made all of these stretch goals that ate about 60% of their Kickstarter money. So now they're taking about $2 million out of Dragon Commander to put into Divinity Original Sin. The game basically gets shit-canned. Um, Original Sin is made with a budget of about $3.5 million after they take out their second loan from the Belgian government. And it was basically to know... and I. I I know that this podcast has talked about like crunch and how it's a terrible thing, how unionization needs to take into the game development studios. Yes. And the owner of the owner of Larian says, you know what? We will never do it again. We are truly sorry. Everyone but he, he kind of maintains that like basically everyone from that original sin project is still on and kind of like we, we understand, we've learned. But it was this game is our last chance. We've already killed one of our projects, so if Original Sin does not do we well, that one? we are we are fucked because that game is 50 hours long. Okay, that's a good reason. Thank you for that. Um, but but the last thing that I'll say, and then I'll take questions. Original <laughs> Sin is so successful. No, I, I promise. I know that this is long winded, but Original Sin is so successful. They make a sequel. They're uh, really smart about it. It is called Divinity Original Sin 2. It is Good also name. raised through Kickstarter. It raises the necessary amount to create the game within hours, reaching all of its stretch goals. They properly planned that, um, so the stretch goals didn't completely eviscerate their money. And many people would argue that Divinity Original Sin 2 is probably the best CRPG made in the past 10 to 15 years. And as a result, they bought the license to make Baldur's Gate 3 from Wizards of the Coast. And so they have been trusted with the most beloved CRPG franchise. And they are the studio that made Dragon Commander is the studio that Wizards of the Coast trusts to follow up BioWare to make a named Baldur's Gate game, a numbered Baldur's Gate game. Very cool. That's what a story, what a history. Dragon Commander is an RTS game. <laughs> it's a bad game. It's an RTS game with 
uh, board game elements like Risk, um, you start out and there's a cutscene and it tells you, hey, you're the Dragon Commander. Your dad was a king, but he he had kids and most of the kids were bad. Um, your mom was a dragon who transformed into a lady and then he boned down with the lady and then had a dragon baby. And you're, you're that dragon baby. And you, as the only person who's not uh, diabolical in the direct line of secession, you gain the support of a ragtag group of generals and defectors who want you to come out of the squabble uh, between, between the Dance of Dragons, I guess you would call it, between the uh, the kids and uh, that are fighting over this country. So you get a, a wizard named Maxos who's not Gandalf. Shut up. <laughs> He's also the only character that continues to exist in the Divinity franchise. Weird. You get other – you get a general who's a lizard man whose name escapes me. Eddie. Edmund. Ed, Edmund. Edmund. Yes. Edmund. Edmund. You get uh, a robot man. Henry. He's, he's got a cyborg, aesthetic. technically. Yeah, he's got a cyborg arm. Um, you get a, a lady who's – she's feisty, Scarlet. Oh, I thought you were going to say Catherine. We like okay. Scarlet. And then Catherine, who's, who – hates men and that's her character trait who could blame her yeah so you got you got a bigoted lizard you've got a drunk cyborg you've got a frisky closeted closeted person. yeah closeted lady who's got uh dyed red hair and you've got a man hating former queen and they are your crew you've got a little imp man who makes you weapons when you need to upgrade, because this is an RTS. He, he, his name is escaping me. Um, it doesn't what was matter. the imp? I didn't talk to him. Uh, um, Groomalo. Um, yeah. No, Groomio. Groomio. Yes, Groomio. You also find out that your ship, it is in the opening cutscene, the ship that you fly on, which is your basically your Normandy, is powered by a demon. It goes full Evangelion on episode one. Yep, it's like, hey, your ship is powered by demons, and all of the weaponry in this world seems to be created by demons, like inspired by demonic thoughts. And you're, but you're using the demonic power for good because you're going to defeat your evil uh, siblings. Maybe there's a twist. Who's to say? So when you're playing the game, there's kind of two modes. You go in your ship, you do, like, Mass effect -y stuff, you talk to your crew, they will ask you questions like, do you want to kill all the orphans, or do you want to save all the orphans? And then you say yes, no. And depending on what you do, you'll get slightly different buffs, because uh, in the Risk game, you both have to build units and move them around on your board, but you also get cards that allow you to kind of have one-time bonuses for individual battles. Basically, the stuff that you do on your ship, um, which races you give favor to, which ones are pissed off at you, will impact your ability on the board to collect gold and produce units. And depending, the, the squares are owned by different creatures. And depending on how they feel about you, they will help you more or less. So I think that covers most of the like overall mechanics. So what do we, what did we think of the risk game? Just like playing the board game. It's better than the alternative. What is the alternative? A real-time strategy game that plays like garbage. Yes. It starts out, you're on the risk board, and whenever there's a conflict between your army and an opposing army, you have a choice to make. You can let the game auto-resolve the combat. You can uh, appoint a general, and each of your generals has specialties. Scarlet's good on defense. Um, Edmund is good on offense. Charlotte is good with ships, and the other guy is good with armored units. And so you kind of want to pick which general will give you the best chance to win. Or you can choose to go in yourself and assume direct control, in which case it plays like Brutal Legend, but way worse. <laughs> I think that's that's the fair thing. You're You're a dragon, and you can fly around in combat and have direct combat like you do in Brutal Legend, um, but... Unlike Brutal Legend, which understood that if you get beyond, like, a certain threshold of units, it will be impossible to control this thing. This game's like, what if it just played, like, a regular RTS? 
and juggling between creating units and controlling your dragon and directing units around and microing all of their little micro abilities. I just found it impossible. It was really, really unpleasant to play. Uh, so I only did like four. You or five say that, but the RTS is actually how you break the game. You pick the offensive minded dragon, you use whatever money you have to increase the shoot speed. Whatever units you get only heal you, and that is the reason why you can actually beat this game in about 30-ish minutes. Because you just make a main line with whatever units you got with a very lightly upgraded dragon and immediately go for the capitals, and nobody can stop you. Yeah, I mean, I, it makes sense because the RTS, the enemies in the RTS are not... Oh, the AI is, the AI is awful. The AI is awful. And I'm not going to defend the RTS part of this game. I think that the world of this game is entertaining enough that I feel bad and feel like these characters deserve a better game. And, like, the, you know, the way that you surface different outcomes is interesting enough that it deserves a better game. But, yeah, the RTS, bad, risk board game is maybe marginally better, but it feels like that... if. They should have picked one of these two rather than try and have it both ways. Yeah. Uh, Pete, what did you think of either the RTS or the board game? Did either of them stick out to you in any way? No, I mean, the, the RTS, not the RTS, the board game I could at least understand and sort of muddle my way through. The RTS was just a lot of, you know what my problem is? is hotkeys. Yep. And especially when you get a game like this, you already said it, Gino, like you're trying to be the dragon and simultaneously deal with all these troop dispositions. And to do that, you need to learn and use hotkeys. I don't want to do that. I've watched like real hardcore StarCraft players. I know what their beats per second is. I don't want to do that. Yeah, my problem was just that once you turn into dragon mode, it becomes very hard to control anything that's not yourself. Like, you, you can't micro anything at that point because you need to click on things so they die. And your dragon is so much more powerful than most of the other stuff in this game. You're really incentivized if you wanted to just roll this game. If you want to never lose any battle, just invest in your dragon and you'll roll pretty much unimpeded for much of the game. But that means you consent to playing the RTS, and I just refused. Um, and what did you think of specifically the board game part? Like, did it jump out to you? Were any of the mechanics interesting? I mean, like, I a I played the RTS once. I got steamrolled, and I was like, that took 45 minutes, and then I lost. Uh, I'm never going to do that again. Yep. So I did not. Uh, Risk, like, is only marginally better. There's no, like, tutorial, really, to this game. There's, like, little hot tips that pop up uh, every once in a while but if you are unfamiliar with the actual style of this gameplay it is not going to hold your hand for that even if you play on the most casual mode so i was like how do i make more troops you have to make factories i was like how do i make factories so basically i was working out of one factory for the majority of my time playing it had no idea how to optimize or how to gain more money. It pretty much was uh, the worst. It was the worst. I did not like it. <laughs> it has, a, like, rocks, paper, scissors with the units. You start out with your kind of ground troops, and then you get mechanized troops, and then you get air troops and and C units. And they each have slightly different moving properties like air units can move three squares mechanized units can move two ground units can move one c units can move two but they have to move in water they can only be out of water for like they can move on to land to fight basically by being adjacent to the land but you can't just like keep moving them along the land you have to hop into sea tiles so you kind of move inefficiently and like some of that's interesting in the abstract and, you know, the units have different rocks, paper, scissors. You know, hunters are good against troops and grenadiers. Grenadiers are good against mechanized units. Armor is good against mechanized units, but bad against air units. You know, there, the, there's this rocks, paper, scissors stuff that's going on, but I just found that the AI, for the most part, doesn't mess with you unless you completely leave your capital undefended. So you can just hoard money for much of this game and then roll because the AI just doesn't 
care to, enough to kill you. No. No, no, it doesn't. Unless you really screw up. Like, when I first played, I was losing a lot in my first hour just because this game explains nothing. It just gives you a bunch of money and says, here, unlock what you want. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know what's good here. You gave me 40 gold. Should I unlock one of the top tier units? Is that what I should do to start? No, you don't want to do that. I unlocked all the base shit first, and then I was like, I don't actually know what any of these things do, but I have them now. Yeah, and, like, they offer you all these passive upgrades, and the passives are, like, the upgrades are predicated on you playing the RTS. And I was like, I'm never playing this. Oh, yeah, there's Maxos, who only gives you dragon upgrades, which, if you're not going to interact with the RTS part, all of his upgrades are pointless. Yeah, I, I upgraded everything before I talked to Maxos once. And then we have the card system, which is just the doyen of this game having possibly too many cooks. It doesn't need to exist. It actually leads to more frustration because the AI uses the same mechanic, which is kind of interesting on concept. But then you go in and you do your little risk thing and then, oh, shit, the AI decided to employ five mercenary cards and now you've lost. Now your army's gone. Yeah, that happens a lot. Like, the cards just, they're basically one-time buffs. You can add units to your army, you can disable certain units that your opponents have, you can raise your money output, you can get free units sometimes, but it's just, like, it's a lot going on for not a lot of, a lot of sizzle, not not much stake. I, I didn't find that I needed the cards very often. Yeah, they were nice to have. You can also commit genocide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can cards. commit genocide. It's a nice yep. touch. Yeah, and... I think that raises the point of this game's morality system, because once you win your first battle, uh, all of a sudden there's a council of the different, the five races, elves, undead, dwarves, lizards, and imps, and these five are like, we're casting our lot with you, Dragon Commander, and they become your small council, basically, and you just have a lot of meetings where they're like, hey, so in your nation... What's the law going to be? Are you going to give everyone universal health care or not? And then if you talk to each of the different races, they will tell you kind of their perspectives. Pete, why don't you summarize the undead? What's their deal? Sure. So the undead are religious fundamentalists. So their whole thing is about appeasing the seven. I guess that's the seven part God they worship. So basically it's just the most stringent Christian morality you could possibly think of. Yep. They're fundamentalists with fascist tendencies. M, what, why don't you describe to me the elves? The elves are hard to pin down a little bit more. They are like rich, upper-class liberals. They are into like the marijuana equivalent because they smoke it for recreational use. They are for illegal immigrants, and they are super into the environment, as elves are wont to do. Yeah, they are. They're kind of like an environmentalist, socialist, commune sort of group. Like a Green yeah. Party sort of deal? Yeah. yeah. Uh, ZP, why don't, you, why don't you explain who the dwarves are? The dwarves are classic Reaganomics. They are what we would call corporate conservatism, the classic right in terms of what's good for big business is good for everyone. Yeah, they are deregulate everything, money driven. They want to have a good time and they don't want the law getting in the way. Pete, what would you say the lizards deal is? The lizards. So the lizards are uh, basically modern liberalism. Like they're all about – actually, they're a little bit more hard line. They're, they're sort of like justice, individual rights, civil rights, very sort of like about protecting the people. I don't know if they would necessarily map onto a, a distinct political faction in modern U.S. politics necessarily. They, they kind of vacillate between libertarian and liberal. Yeah, they're more they're more yeah interventionist than like a traditional libertarian, but they definitely have that individualist bent. So would you call them kind of neo Keynesiist in that regard? No. That's more of like I don't know what their economic platform is. They they want to deregulate actually. They, one of mm -hmm. the so the lizards once proposed getting all of the old tax code and simplifying it, like getting rid of a bunch of taxes because it was too difficult. Like the tax laws made no sense. And they wanted an elegant tax code that had a lower tax bracket. I was like, oh, okay, you guys are libertarians. They also don't do military intervention that much, but they're, they mix, they vacillate. Yeah, they're not like liberal because they're very sort of like anti other stuff, but they're, they're rationalists, I guess. Yeah, like they, they want democracy. That's their big thing. They want people to be able to realize their own wants and needs. 
and we'll talk about how you they have to eat some humble pie when they support democracy because that ooh that one's a good one. We got the imps. Yep, they're yeah. They're technocrats. They're just technocrats with a, a libertarian stance on social issues. They do not care about the social issues. And even you see that Trinkolo flip a coin is like, yep, I'm gonna side with the undead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the imps just want to be able to make cool guns and blow things up, and that's kind of their whole deal. Did you get the? Um, they have one thing that they ask for where it's like, can we dig up this ancient elven cemetery <laughs> yeah, so we can get that. uranium, so we can build atomic bombs, build our super weapons? Yeah, uh, so, I did not let them do that. That's so well, is. so here's the one thing that I will say though. Um, Every race in this game has at least one time in which they will propose an idea where they are the only race that supports it, whereas all of the other four races are in unison and saying, no, that is a horrible idea. Should you pick that option, that race will be hard locked to support you no less than 90%, and you will get their permanent buffs for the rest of the game. Oh, I didn't know that. And everyone else drops significantly, but... You got to remember, it's like you get cards out of these people. You get buffs out of these people. And if you let one of the races drop too low, you actually get debuffs. So, for example, if you let Yorick drop below 35%, he'll start dropping your luck meter. I actually had that happen to where I had negative 2 luck, whereas I had the lizards at 100%. And so I had some pretty bad coin flips a couple of times. Yep, that is that happened to me. Yorick is the worst with that. He'll sucks. fuck up your whole thing if. Uh... Yeah, yeah. If you get bad luck, like York is also the one of the hardest people to actually side with because he has the most scenarios where it's just him and Falstaff, and so you're looking at a two to three situation in order to just get up his. Which is why, when we talk about the princesses, why I married his princess. So did I. But while we're on the subject, too, a lot of good Shakespeare references. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This game, just loaded with Shakespeare. Well, did you find out... Well, the whole idea of the undead is that they've died once and they've come back to life. Did you find out how York died? No. Well, did anyone? Mm, no. I didn't bother. Uh, well, he basically admits that he became a religious zealot later in life because... He caught on fire while masturbating to pornography on his bed. Sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a common risk. When you're under candlelight, this is the risk that you undertake, and he knew what he was getting into. And now he's got eternal life. But he can't masturbate anymore. That's true. So, oh, is he in heaven Pete, or hell? If you, dated, if you dated the skeleton princess, you know oh, there's a way. I did. I married the skeleton princess. Yeah, so who? She's not a skeleton for all. Yeah, so you get a choice once you get to round two. So the first round, you're taking on one of your siblings. You take them out. It's kind of the tutorial level. Then you get to a multiplayer game, kind of, with three siblings. Um, And at that point, you get to pick a bride because you need to make a strategic alliance. You can choose between an elf princess who's way into you, a lizard princess who is like, I'm here because diplomacy. at all. Yeah, yeah, she's a Supreme Court justice, though. Yeah, she is. She is the Supreme Court justice, which is kind of cool. There's a skeleton princess who Yorick tells her that she should marry you, and she's very deferential. Yes, but she's also a skeleton, so that's upset. That's upsetting. Sure. And um, the dwarven princess wants don't you to, judge. You know, wants you to marry her because her she hates her father and she wants to get out of father's line of work. So who did everyone pick? Ophelia. Oh, yeah. We we should mention there was also going to be a uh, imp princess. Oh, right. She got cut from the game. The reasoning that there is not one is that they exploded playing hide the fuse, which is I guess a common thing for imps. Yeah, no one seems uh, that broken up about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Trinkolo makes the point of saying, "Well, you know what? That's the way we all imps want to go out with a bang." Yeah, mm-hmm. she, she died a true imp's death. That one. Yeah. That's some good old dev uh, thinking on their feet. Yep. We don't want to program a fifth one. We're just going to sweep that under the rug. Yep. It makes the imps kind of underdeveloped, which sucks in a way because you, you yeah. just can't. It's hard to just toss a bunch of bones to the imps to make them stay up. Can I reveal what the imp princess's plotline would have been? 
Sure. Because I have it open here. Originally planned as a princess to marry, she would have come to you already secretly pregnant. Your plot with her would have involved your treatment of your illegitimate son, Rufus, uh, who, being an imp, would grow up really fast. Your imp son is uh, pictured in some concept art, wearing a sailor outfit, a beanie with a propeller, and a big uh, lollipop. That would have been great. Yeah, Good that cut. would have been <laughs> my choice. So who did we actually pick? Ophelia, my skeleton broad. Yep. I, I, w- I sided with Ophelia as well. I had a mission in terms of what I wanted to do with Ophelia, and we'll talk oh. about it later. Mm-hmm. No, I, I I had a greater mission, Pete. Not all of us are about the carnal desires. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> how could you look at that that beautiful body and resist that, you know? I, I love how everyone gives you shit when you pick the skeleton princess. Like, all of your commanders are like, what did you just do? <laughs> Why? They're like, you have a weird fetish, don't you? Yeah, there's a lot of necrophilia jokes. At this point, I had stopped playing the game and went to watching the game because <laughs> the actual gameplay is miserable. So the thing I watched also picked Ophelia first. Well, I picked the lizard. How was you that? picked poorly. Well, <laughs> every every one of the brides has their own storyline. Ophelia is dealing with the fact that she's got bone cancer, basically. <laughs> she's got bone she's got Skellington ba- cancer. We gotta save Ophelia. Yeah, she's got bonitis. Um, <laughs> so she's. You need to save her from her bonitis. The lizard, her thing is that she's a Supreme Court justice, and so she comes to you with cases all the time, just like talking to you. It's great because when you first meet her, she's just like, yeah, this would be a marriage strictly for diplomatic reasons. And then when you like get her back to your to her quarters, she is even icier to you than she was up front. She's just like, look, I don't like you. We live together, I guess. Maybe I'll bounce questions off of you, though you're a human, so I don't expect you do very well at reasoning. But uh, maybe I'll bounce ideas off of you if I feel like it. Please leave. So yeah, she mostly just like asks you about court decisions, and you can sway her. And most of her court decisions, because she's on the Supreme Court, have to do like with great consequences for different races. I mean, Gino, that sounds interesting, but you can turn Ophelia into a busty vampire. Yeah. So I mean, who I, really I wins? I did the vampire here? route. Yeah. I've done the mecha suit route, where you basically turn her into a robot, but I turned her into a vampire. A busty because... robot, it should be known. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, we should mention the the character designs for the princesses are bad. I think they're bad. Ada is bad. Uh, yeah. She has the rarely seen double boob window. Top and bottom. Yeah. Uh, the dwarf? Yes. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. So I'll just run down it. Ada, like, here's the interesting thing about the princesses is that they are all inversions. They show that there's a little bit more diversity to these cultures that you would normally get out of the counselors because each of them is a bit of an inversion of the morals and ethics represented by the counselors. For example, Camilla is a crime and law type of person. She is straightforward, straight arrow. You do the crime, you get the time. Uh, whereas Ada comes from a male-dominated kind of culture who's trying to like further her research, and she comes from an abusive household, and she's not used to someone kind of being kind to her or being in an environment that uh, values like female scientific research. And so she's like trying to get used to that. But for the most part, most of them are comedic. Like if you marry the elven wife, she becomes a hedonist and you have a choice in terms of whether you want to execute her for forsaking her elven morals or stand by her. And she turns into a dark elf and um, basically like starts doing blood sacrifices. What? Is that how that ends? Yeah, she starts. See, yeah, there's a way to get another wife, which I'm sure we'll mention a little bit later. The players who I was watching uh, had had Ophelia, got her to her sort of end point, and then got Lohana, mm-hmm. uh, which is the Elven princess. And you can tell like right away that she's gonna. Get rid of all of the uh, trappings of elvish society pretty quick. They're like, we don't eat meat. She starts eating meat. She starts drinking. Yeah, she goes a little off the deep end there. Interesting to know that your options are execute her or she becomes like a YouTube star in this 
canon. <laughs> That's awesome. I did not know that. Like everyone likes her except the elves. They're like, yeah, oh, she's she becomes really fun. a celebrity. Yeah, yeah. She gets statues made of her, which the elves also have problems with because they're like, "That's sacrilege." Well, she's fun. York probably hates her just because York hates fun. He yeah, hates fun. The only parts of this game that really differentiate from Run to Run are the princesses. Um, depending on which princess you choose, all the other story beats are pretty much the same. There's some randomization on which propositions. For example, if you do certain things, so like I said, you remember um, Prospera proposes like, why don't we become a republic? Why don't we have a democratically elected leader? And it's like, if you support that, if you do that, if you if you support that, there's a democratic election, and Prospera is like, oh god, this is great. We're gonna have some leader that unites the entire country, and the person who wins the election is Falstaff, and she's like, fuck. She's not like, fuck, she's like, look, we have to obey the will of the people. And Falstaff's like, you shouldn't let me be in charge. (laughs) I would do a bad job. This whole people governing themselves is dumb. And all the other people are like, Falstaff paid everyone. He paid people for votes. Falstaff basically comes clean and is like, I proved a point. I paid people to vote for me. This system is broken. People are too stupid to govern themselves is basically his argument, yeah. and everyone agrees with him. And this kind of raises my big problem with this game's morality system. I actually went through with making him president in a run, and nothing happens. Like, all that happens is some – like, everyone hates you except the lizards, and you get some slightly different cards, and then you move on with your day because none of these choices matter. Like, all of them just toggle – some sliders up or down in either direction, you get a slightly different card. And it's not like you make a bad choice and then the game's just fucked or something. Or like you are you just lose. You have a fail state. Falstaff runs the country to the ground. You just get a different card than you would have gotten if you picked the other choice. So it's, it's like the Mass Effect morality system where one choice is clearly wrong and one choice is clearly right. But you just get rewarded for either choice. There's really no hard decisions. The game finds I see away. where you're coming from, but again, this was a feature that was supposed to be the heart of Dragon Commander, and it was seriously cut. Like, you were supposed to have, like, characters leave if you let their percentages drop below 1% or 0%, like, characters would leave. I believe that there was a better version of this they could have made. Yes. <laughs> I could imagine. But this is the one we got. But this is the one yeah. we played, so, like, none of the consequences really matter. I, I did find some of the stories of your commanders to be a little endearing like scarlet's fun her quest yeah. to come out is really cool maxus getting over the loss of his limbs and like coming together with henry oh uh, sorry yeah henry henry with um scarlet and catherine like coming together to to form a did a drop that bomb on that skeleton orphanage what i'm yeah. still <laughs> kind of sad i'm still salty about that he's like yeah we just dropped the bomb to scare the bad guys away oh yeah by the way the bomb dropped into a skeleton orphanage but they were dead anyway so you know what whatever it's fine they had a fun time rescuing his daughter what actually did you go with for that one oh i i had henry fess up and like take it on the chin and he actually changes as a character which eases him into kind of like the scarlet outcome where scarlet tries to be closeted by starting to date Henry and Henry slowly changes to realize you should actually be who you are. We're friends. Let's be wife. And then like Henry has probably one of the more distinct kind of iconic character transformations over the course of the story, yeah. um, which I quite enjoyed. He grows which is weird because it seems like he has less dialogue than most of the other characters. Yeah. Like, it's almost it seems like, like characters in this game are undeveloped. I, Edmund Edmund also has some good stuff in his his story arc. Does he ever stop being a terrible bigot? Well, mm. actually, yes, he does. There's two turning points. There's the one where he has to has to save the village. You, he sees the aftermath of a genocide, and he actually he he's not the one who commits the genocide. He witnesses an act of genocide, and then this and he's like, "Why do I feel sad about these people being killed? I'm supposed to be okay with this." And then the second one that happens if you further Edmund's story arc is he actually falls in love with an elf, mm-hmm. and he realizes, "Wait, do I turn her down or do I just follow my heart?" And you actually can control whether or not he continues his dialogue continues to be bigoted or he cuts that shit out and actually falls in love and marries an elf. I mean, good for him that he's not a bigot, but like 
that individual romance was the solution is a little unsavory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, again, I, I mean, it's it's how much, again, this gets back to the Eurojank thing, is like how much do you want to give them credit for trying to find, again, like the alternative would have been the hardcore like alignment charts D&D style where this entire race is represented chaotic good, this entire race is represented as chaotic evil, whereas they're mapped on kind of the political compass, there's some movement here and there through the means of like thumbs up, thumbs down, red, blue. But I find the idea of these characters being represented by a set of code, a code of ethics and morals kind of like on that political compass a little bit more compelling than, say, hard alignments. Yeah. And it kind of leads to like, you know, Larian has been trying to reform the D&D alignment system when they... This is another weird story that I'll just tell. When they got the rights to uh, Baldur's Gate 3, they're like, oh, my God, Wizards, we're so happy that you gave us the rights to make this game. This is a passion project of us. Here are three ideas of how to fix the alignment system in D&D. And basically, Wizards said, nah, no, we're not interested. Just do the old system. Just no, no, no. We gave you this license because it's important. No, you're not going to vibe on it. My issue isn't with, like, the alignment chart or anything. I guess my issue is, like, if you want to have a politics sim and you basically devolve all your political decisions to, like, individual personality traits, like, these aren't systemic issues. This is more like, eh, York seems like a dick. This isn't a good idea. And then not, like, a question of what are the political, cultural economic ramifications beyond slider movement yeah and there's no there's no way for you to make a choice that is clearly the right choice for your society and then have it pan out like and maybe that's more indicative of the real world than we'd like to admit where someone makes a choice that is good for society but the factions that were predisposed to not like it will not like it regardless of whether it is good for society like, you can give everyone universal health care, but when you do that, Yorick will say if the seven deemed for them to die, they would they should die. And the dwarves are like, that costs money. That's stupid. It doesn't matter if everyone would be healthier. They don't care. Um, same thing with, like, the legalizing weed. Uh, those folks will not like it regardless. It makes these policies just abs- – it's all down to the sliders. It doesn't really matter what you're doing, what the thumbs up, thumbs down is. The game plays the same – pretty much regardless of what you choose. And so it's funny to hear each of these different races like takes on the the issue of the day. And they try to make sure that almost all the thumbs up, thumb down ones are like torn from the headlines issues, but it doesn't impact the gameplay or the story in any meaningful way outside of a handful of moments. So, you know, A for trying, A for F, E for effort. I mm-hmm. don't disagree. I do want to say... In terms of, like, the way that they budgeted this game, like, the dialogue is really well done. The writing for this game is surprisingly well. Again, this is from a non-English-speaking country. Oh, in terms of, like, grammar? Yes. Because like the, the twist actual, is dumb. Well, oh, yeah, the twist is absolutely stupid. Okay. But, like, in terms of, like, the dialogue for the characters, it's actually good. And I thought that the voice acting was quite well done. Everything you do on the ship, great. And then Act 3 happens, and holy shit. Before we get to Act 3, we got to talk about the thing that's mentioned in the first line of the game. Oh, right. Corvus, your demon engine, uh, the <laughs> thing that is in the middle of your ship. How would you describe Corvus? Eva 01, literally. Um, yeah. It is, and it looks like Eva 01. I love how it's the voice of Strahd from D&D, like, again, this game is inspired by D&D, and it pulls from very iconic characters and settings in terms of how it deals with a lot of that. But um, it's a real WTF moment, because you hear that it's powered by some sort of, like, demon spirit, and then you see it, and it's like, holy crap, this is crazy. It's a big old monster in the center of the ship. It's a big monster in the center of the ship. I wonder Um, who came up with that idea. It's a cool one. It's Evangelion. No, I just mean, like, in terms of, like, practicality. Like, who was like, oh, we need to build a ship. What should we power with? Like, gasoline? Like, ooh, solar? Like, <laughs> well, no, let's just chain if up you talk to Maxos, Maxos says that basically this is actually a flying prison. They want to use Corvus 
while also containing Corvus, but basically turning on the ship and using Corvus's energy basically mutes him or controls him. And if, like, the ship stops moving and running, then Corvus would not have all of his energy sucked away from him, and he would that's, break free. That's a bad plan. That's a terrible plan. <laughs> well, it, if the plan sounds bad, it's because it is. Uh, Corvus visits all of your brothers and sisters brothers and sisters with visions of weapons so that they can build powerful weapons so that's how they get their weapons is him giving them to them and when you talk to corvus he's like hey i could give you even better stuff if you give me the blood of the <laughs> sleeping um i can do one of two things for you baby well three things first if you want you know one of these one of these civilizations to like you more just let me kill some of them and then the rest will like you uh, if you want some support, you know, in combat or something, just let me kill random people in your country, and then uh, I'll give you support, and then you can give him your wife, and then he'll give you cards. It, like, all he gives you is cards. Yeah, it's yeah. the reward's not worth it at all. No. But that I mean, is if the you way want a you new wife. A new that's, wife. That's true. The main benefit <laughs> is getting, like, a new wife storyline. Like, if you are at Ophelia's end point... You can that jump in. to someone else. Shorty, let me upgrade you. Now you're a vampire, and I don't know if I'm cool with that, so blood no, for No, I was demon. definitely cool with that. Like, granted, you're much bustier than before, but eh, I don't know if it's worth it. Compared to bones? <laughs> exactly. They're bonitis. Did you do anything, Corvus? No, uh, once? absolutely not. If you do let Corvus feast upon the blood of the innocent, it makes Chapter 3 harder because he betrays you. Yeah. And you have to it's fight Corvus and his army. But yeah, it's the game doesn't change meaningfully when you go mm -hmm. to Chapter 3, even if you are completely good about not feeding people to the demon. But yeah, that's kind of the game. It's, it's really not that long once you know what the hell's going on, but it doesn't tutorialize well. It's very mundane. There's interesting bits all over it, but this, it is not greater than the sum of its parts. No. There are parts that shouldn't be there. The actual ending of the game is super insulting to anyone who actually likes divinity. Basically what happens is, like, one of the big things that's kind of like, as someone who is following divinity, it's like, holy shit, why is it, we're 2,000 years in the past. Why do we have all this technology? Why is the past more technologically advanced than, you know, what is actually happening in Original Sin and the divinity proper games? And then the solution is, is oh, wait, maybe we're not ready to handle this technology, and they just throw it into a volcano. Yep, they just undo all of it. Is that what fucking that? happens? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they basically take work. all of the technology of the world, and they throw it into a volcano. And They have gone. this beautiful steampunk world that's actually kind of cool, and they throw it in a volcano. That's literally never worked in history. No society has ever been able to roll back technology despite trying and yet here we are two thousand years later in divinity original sin <laughs> not a steampunk hat to be found you're right Hold on. why would any of the races like the imps in particular why would they do that ever because the dragon man was scary and threatened to kill them corvus yeah. just ate your wife <laughs> he does that to a lot of people like everybody that's like his only thing yeah, <laughs> he just wants a, blood he's really into blood it would have so been interesting if, like, yeah, it, it would have been interesting if it was like, oh, an apocalyptic event caused us to technologically go in reverse. And it would have been nice if, like, the past was, I mean, this is a significant amount of time between Dragon Commander and Original Sin. They could have found a better way to get from point A to point B. But no, they just gather up all the technology and throw it into the volcano. Put it in the hot pot. You know, you see a bunch of characters with, like, artificial limbs because they lost them. And it's like, did you take their fucking arms and legs? Yep. In the volcano. <laughs> they just pushed the whole person. They didn't even bother. I think we should have known something was amiss when the dragon had a jetpack. <laughs> yeah. That's... Like, I think that's a sign of things to come. As far as things to get you playing this game, telling someone the dragon has a jetpack... Uh, is pretty up there, though. <laughs> that's true. That is quite the teaser. With that, I think that's everything we've got for Dragon Commander. This game's okay. Like, you could check it out. It's a, it's a novelty. Oh, it 100% is a novelty. And also, you know, we live in an era where 
Larian's the last kind of double A, single A CRPG maker that's not like an indie developer because now they're all owned by Microsoft. Yeah, that happened today. Because In Exile is got bought, and they were the other Eurojank developer. Obsidian got bought. Bethesda just got bought. CD Projekt Red, I guess, is still independent. Larian's independent. Spiders made Greedfall, and it's barely an RPG. So yeah, they're all dead. Like this genre is gone. And that's the part that is kind of lamentable is like you're not seeing people shoot for the skies. And if they are, it's like these RPG Maker games, which let's not go there. I mean, nothing wrong against RPG Maker, but I mean, these games are so much, they're so weird. They are. So with that, that'll close our time on Divinity Dragon Commander. Um, It is now my turn once again to pick what game to play next. And I've decided I want to go. I want to go back to the universe. No, we're not staying in the divinity universe. Don't even put that evil in in my head. Um, I want to play a classic. It's been a while since I picked a classic that is actually a classic. Math Blaster. No, I don't threaten me with a good time. Commander Keen. <laughs> don't again. Don't threaten me with a good time. Jazz Jack Rabbit. Uh, not that far back. I want to play Bioshock. Oh, shit. Okay. We did Bioshock Infinite four, five years ago or something. Yeah, that was early. That, that was one of our earliest episodes. We made the mistake. That was before we learned our lesson. That was actually episode four in 2015. Oh, Way back. That's when you guys were buying new games hot from the presses. Yeah, that was uh, – we had the mistake. We tried to do Bioshock Infinite and The Walking Dead – and The Last of Us, <laughs> all in the same episode. Like 180 what hours the fuck? Game. <laughs> We each played a different game. I played the walk. I played Bioshock Infinite. Someone else played The Walking Dead, and someone else played The, the Last of Us. It was supposed to be like relationships in, in games that were not sexual in nature, and it turned mm. out that they were all action dad games. All three mm. of them. A lot of more discussion of drop charts. Yes. So we have not played the original Bioshock on this podcast before, and that's a game that I remember loving very much, holding very fond memories of, and I haven't played it in 10 years almost. So I, I want to take a look at it. I want to see if it holds up. Yeah, let's do it. I will also say that I am a diehard defender of Bioshock 2, uh, especially if you ever played Bioshock 2, if you play it's DLC, The Tinker, oh my god. Probably the greatest DLC ever made. But yeah, that that's going to be a fun one for y'all. I want to play a fun game. We've played Night Trap and we played this. So I want to play something I know is fun. <laughs> and you're also playing some interesting games with the other podcast, Gino. Yep, Chrono Cross is coming to a close soon. We're working on it. So thank you, Pete. Yeah, it was you know interesting to play what was basically a fascism simulator. It has its moments. <laughs> yep, thank you, M. Thank you. Uh, this was a better movie than a game. And it wasn't a very good movie. Yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> thank thank, thank you, ZP. Do you know what happens on November 26th? No. Hopefully the it meteor hits. Is, <laughs> there is the release of Nekopara Volume 4. Oh Nekopara Volume 4, the fourth entry of the Nekopara franchise will be coming to you hot in two Oh wow. Where'd he go? <laughs> we're gonna delete we're gonna we're gonna date. We're going to France. Our dad we got uh, what happened? Bye everybody. Thank you listeners. Just a reminder, if you wanted to uh get in touch with the show, you can do so at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, deeplistens.libson.com. We've got our comment sections and Deep Listens Podcast at gmail dot com. You can send in emails. You can also support the show, patreon.com slash deep listens. ZP, are you going to be nice? Are you going to play nice? What? Who? You could say bye. Who am I? Are you going to be nice? Who are you people? All right. Uh, Bye. Bye. Thank you, listeners. Till next time. Peace. I like that I have the mute power. (laughs) You've learned from our dictator sim.